Yo, what's going on guys? This is Brendan Mushi, and today we're going to be doing a recap of the entire Guilty Gear storyline. Obviously, this is a huge challenge to tackle, so I'm going to be doing this in the most lazy and to the point way I possibly can. There's a lot of lore and a lot of retcons in the Guilty Gear storyline, and I'm mainly only going to be following the story of Soul Bad Guy, That Man, The Universal Will, and Justice. So the very first important thing that happens in the Guilty Gear lore is a man known as the Sage or the Original travels to the backyard and comes back alive. What is the backyard, you ask? The Backyard is an alternate world in the Guilty Gear universe that basically contains all information about our current world. So basically the relationship between the Backyard and the real world is that of a computer and a video game. The Sage feared that somebody evil might discover the Backyard and use its power for evil, and so he would lock up his information and findings regarding the Backyard and leave it at an unknown location, believing that he'd saved the world. But the real evil wouldn't be somebody finding the Backyard, it would be the evil that came from the Backyard itself. That evil is referred to as the universal will, and it is either directly or indirectly responsible for basically every bad thing that happens in the major Guilty Gear storyline. The universal will's goal is to destroy humanity because it believes that humans are not the true humans, and it wants to wipe out humanity and make way for the real humans. This brings us to the next major event in the Guilty Gear storyline called the Dawn of Revival. The Universal Will attempted to manifest itself in the real world through electronic devices. In response, the United Nations had to ban all electronic devices from use, but this resulted in the collapse of society. Luckily that same year, a group called the Apostles appeared and taught magic to the Guilty Gear society. This is why in the Guilty Gear universe almost everything they use is because of magic. The five Apostles who spread their arcane knowledge to the Guilty Gear universe were followers of the original. These five would eventually form a group known as the Conclave that basically has power over the entire Guilty Gear universe, including over the United Nations. Four years later, after magic was discovered, think of all the possibilities. Think of everything you could do with magic at your disposal. You could even say, advance evolution and strengthen the human race. And that is exactly what three American scientists were tasked with doing. Frederick Balsara, who eventually becomes Soul Bad Guy, Arya Hale, and Asuka R. Kreitz, which at the time is known throughout the series as That Man. They were three friends and talented scientists, with Frederick and Arya being lovers and Asuka R. Kreitz being known as their superior. So what began as a project to prevent and fix human human illnesses, eventually turned into a project that that man feared could be weaponized. So because of this, that man would turn his research on the gear cells over to the government on four conditions, otherwise he would destroy it. Meanwhile, Arya Hale had come down with an incurable disease. When Sol, or at the time known as Frederick, found this out, he basically begged her to go into cryo sleep until they were able to find a cure. Arya Hale refused because she wanted to spend her last moments with her lover Frederick instead of being in cryo sleep where he could potentially die while she's asleep. So in probably one of the worst attempts at sympathy I have ever seen, that man without Sol's consent turned Sol into the first prototype gear, the Flame of Corruption. This would ensure that Soul would live indefinitely, and this was the only way that he could get Arya to agree to go into a cryo sleep. That man sabotaged the rest of his research and escaped with Arya's body in cryo sleep, while Soul woke up somewhere with amnesia, not understanding why his friend had turned him into a gear and had betrayed him, not knowing his friend's intentions, he would swear vengeance upon that man. He develops a metal headband that suppresses his gear cells that makes him appear as human despite the fact that he is a gear. Oh, and also he becomes a bounty hunter. Years and years later, that man's greatest fear would actually come true when the United States government would reinitialize the gear project again. This time, they were able to actually mass produce many gears and weaponize them to take over other countries. In response to this, that man turned Arya into the commander type gear Justice. Justice had the ability to control other gears. That man was hoping to use her ability to control other gears to stop the wars. But um, you remember that universal will thing I talked about earlier? So um, yeah, so that thing from the backyard comes back and it actually seizes Justice as its vessel. The universal will wanting to destroy humanity attempts to turn the citizens of Japan into antimatter gears. When that man saw all of Japan's citizens being turned into antimatter gears that would be turned against humanity, he used Justice's gamma ray and overrode her motor functions and used the gamma ray to destroy Japan, making him look even more like an asshole even though he's trying to do the right thing. However, taking over Justice's controls and forcing her to do that shattered her psyche, because remember, Justice does have her own consciousness. How would you feel if someone overrode your body and made you blow up all of Japan? <laughs> That man was able to save half of Arya's consciousness, but the other half that remains in Justice felt that Gears were treated as little more than slaves. And so she felt it was time for her and her people to rebel. 
So Justice, the Commander Gear, used her ability to gather an army of Gears and declared war on humanity. This war between Gears and humans was referred to as the Crusades. That man was since branded a war criminal and disappeared from the world. He would then try to figure out a way to restore Arya whole again. Sol, hearing of what that man had done, would begin constructing a device referred to as the Outrage. It consists of multiple parts, some of which include the Fire Seal, which produces and amplifies fire magic, Thunder Seal, which produces and amplifies lightning magic, Zessen, produces and amplifies wind magic, Flashing Fang, produces and amplifies light magic. In response to Justice's army of gears, humanity formed the Sacred Order of Holy Knights, led by Cliff Underson. The war lasted a hundred years, and by the point that the war had ended, Kai Kisuke had become the new leader of the Sacred Order of the Holy Knights, and he was able to seal Justice in an alternate dimension with the help of Soul Bad Guy. The remaining gears that were previously under Justice's controls were rounded up and promptly destroyed. Five years later, after the Crusades had ended, Justice's dimensional prison began to weaken. This finally brings us to the plot of the very first Guilty Gear game, because the world leaders did what any world leaders would do in this situation, and they decided to organize an international fighting tournament. They did this because they wanted to select new members for a second Sacred Order of Holy Knights that would be able to fight Justice if she were resurrected. Honestly, the whole tournament just seemed sus as fuck, but the prize was tempting as it said that the winner would get any wish, any wish at all. In the canon storyline, Soul Bad Guy is obviously the winner of the tournament, and of course there's no wish, everyone had been tricked, and the one who hosted the tournament was actually Testament, and the reason that this tournament was created was a plot to revive justice. And you're probably like, wait, 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 but Brendan, you never brought Testament into the story at any point. And you're right but I'm gonna explain that right now. So Testament during the Crusades was Cliff's son, his adopted son, and he wasn't actually a fighter in the Crusades, but he was tricked by the government and experimented on by them and was turned into a gear. Before Justice was actually sealed, because Testament was turned into a gear, he was controlled by Justice during the Crusades. After Justice was sealed, her influence still lingered in Testament, and so Testament was controlled by Justice even though Justice was sealed, her influence caused him to act in such a way that would lead to her being revived. Testament tells Soul that only the blood of one more sacrifice is required to revive Justice. Soul beats the shit out of Testament, and Testament's like, hey bro, I didn't say it had to be you, and Testament quote unquote dying causes Justice to be revived. Immediately, Soul and Justice throw hands on sight. Justice recognizes, due to Soul's strength, that he's definitely a gear, and so she tries to use her commander type powers to control Soul, and she's confused as to why she's unable to do this. Soul reveals that the reason that she's unable to control him is because he is the prototype gear that precedes her, he is the original gear, and thus she can only control gears created after her, but is unable to control him. Soul then kills Justice, and in Justice's dying words, she utters, I wish that the three of us could talk one last time. Soul, feeling a bit guilty that his research with that man led up to this and killing his own girlfriend, makes him the guilty gear. Yeah. And this brings us to the next Guilty Gear mainline title, Guilty Gear X story. So less than a year later after the events where Soul kills Justice, there's some information going around in the news of another gear that's still walking around in public, which is weird because now that Justice has been destroyed, there shouldn't be any other functioning gears, but there is one because Justice left behind an offspring, a daughter. And this gear goes by the name of Dizzy. Just the existence of Dizzy, despite the fact that she's peaceful and is not a threat at all, puts the world in a state of panic. Dizzy is extremely powerful because anybody that's been sent to capture her promptly got folded. An announcement was made that whoever brings about the demise of this dreadful gear shall be rewarded with the lofty sum of 500,000 world dollars. Testament has survived the events of the previous game and has regained his original personality. Feeling guilty for what he's done, he lays flowers at his father's grave and he eventually finds Dizzy in the grove. Testament empathizes with Dizzy's dilemma that everyone wants to kill her just because she's a gear and he vows to protect her. Not really sure why, because she's like 10 times stronger than him, but canonically Soul is the one that ends up finding her because he's a bounty hunter. Testament tries to protect her, but that's good eats for Soul. Soul is then able to confront Dizzy and they begin fighting. <laughs> He 
He then decides to let her go free. Dizzy would eventually find a home among the jellyfish pirates alongside May and Johnny. Jam actually happened to be watching this go down in the background, so the bounty actually ended up falling to her, which she uses to fund her restaurant. And this brings us to the events of the third main Guilty Gear title, Guilty Gear XX. This game takes place two weeks after the events of the previous game where Dizzy is defeated by Soul. And the main antagonist of this game is Eno, a servant of that man. Eno loves chaos and fucking shit up, so the entire premise of every character's story in this game is basically just Eno in some way or another fucking with them. Eno launches an attack on the May ship that throws Dizzy overboard, prompting a search from May and Johnny to look for her. When Soul meets with Eno, he instantly wants to know where that man is and tells him to get out here right now so he can catch this fate. Eno of course refuses his request and they begin fighting. <laughs> Soul, of course, ends up the victor and asks more information about that man. Eno once again refuses until that man himself shows up. Sangare,いいの、久しぶりだな、フレデリック。いやー。聖球なことだ。うわ。いずれ真の戦いが来る。聖戦すら霞む。この星の危機がな。だから、どうした。戦士が必要なのだよ。百年の戦歴に旧時代の英知を持ち合わせた真の強者がその憎しみがお前を鍛え上げる。しばしの別れだ、フレデリック。畜生。畜生。この命にかけてあいつの敵は取ってみせる。so after that, Eno, that man, and his other subordinate, Raven, go back into hiding. That man and Raven punish Eno for her actions. Eno says that she was just trying to get Soul out of that man's way. That man lets Eno know that Soul is crucial to what he has planned for the world. Sometime during all of this, Dizzy meets Kai, and Kai says that he'll be able to help Dizzy understand her gear powers a bit better. She trusts him and goes to stay with him, and eventually the two fall in love. Also, at some point during these events, the Kingdom of Illyria is created. It's basically just Europe divided up into states, and it's governed by three kings. Kai Kisuke being one of them, Leia Whitefang being another, and Daryl being the third. And so with that, we are now on the fourth installment of the Guilty Gear series called Guilty Gear 2 Overture, which was actually not a fighting game. After some years had passed, Kai and Dizzy had given birth to a son named Sin, but due to Kai's king duties, he was unable to raise him, which is why Soul raised him as a bounty hunter. He appears much older than he actually is due to rapid aging due to being a gear. While Soul and Sin are traveling, they receive a call for help from Kai. Shortly after receiving this call for help, they are attacked by a strange army that appear to be creatures from the backyard. This army that's attacking them is being led by a woman named Valentine, who is a creation from the backyard, created by the Universal Will that we mentioned much earlier. After the fight, they are assisted by a man named Izuna, who is also from the backyard, and he takes them to the Kingdom of Illyria to meet with Kai. Once they get to Illyria Castle, they find Kai suspended in a binding spell, and they also find Raven, one of that man's henchmen there, next to Kai. Raven tells Soul that it's too early to kill him as he's too necessary for the world, and then he leaves. So far, all Sin, Soul, and Izuna know is that Valentine from the backyard is in search of gears, as gears all over the world are disappearing. The reason they attacked Illyria Castle was because they were looking for Dizzy, as since Dizzy has Justice's DNA, she is the key to the Universal Will's plans. Confused and looking for answers, Izuna takes them to meet Dr. Paradigm on an island where the inhabitants are peaceful gears whose consciousness returned to them after Justice was destroyed but they had nowhere else to go. Soul, upon talking to Dr. Paradigm, learns from Dr. Paradigm that all of the magic they use in the Guilty Gear universe and the creation of the gear cells all stem from the backyard. It was as if humans were borrowing power from the backyard. And he also mentions that humans cannot just simply enter the backyard because if they do, they would be crushed by its immense pressure. He tells Soul that he discovered that that man created a structure called the Cube, which is a man-made structure in the backyard that would actually allow people to exist within the backyard space space within that cube. Not only that, but the cube is locked and the only way to enter it is by using the pure gear cells related to justice. That's the key and that's what Valentine is searching for. The reason why Valentine wants this key in order to open the cube is because it's believed that if you were able to get into the cube, you would have access to control the backyard. And like I said earlier, having access to control the backyard would mean that you would have access to the computer systems that control how our real world functions. And so Dr. Paradigm is basically just afraid and unsure of exactly what's going on, but he's aware of Soul's connection to that man, and that's why he sent Izuna after Soul to retrieve him at the very beginning of Overture. 
After their discussion, Sol, Sin, Izuna, and Dr. Paradigm go back to Illyria Castle to see if they can help free Kai from his binding. Upon freeing him, they ask if the Maiden of the Grove, Dizzy, is still doing okay, to which Kai replies he can't say for sure. This pisses Sin off, makes him call his own dad a shitty king, and tells him he can't protect anything and runs off. Kai explains to the rest of the group that the reason he couldn't say for sure was because he had to also seal Dizzy in her own kind of binding using the Thunder Seal. The reason that she's in that frozen binding state is because Kai had to freeze her in place in order to prevent her from being kidnapped and stolen by Valentine. Kai explains that because he rushed it, he's not sure if he can release the seal now or how long the condition will last. It's at this point where the group has the oh shit moment of realizing that Valentine is specifically after gears that have Justice's cells, and while Valentine is unable to currently capture Dizzy because of this frozen state, Sin just stormed off from the group, so they immediately realize they have to go find Sin as soon as possible or else he's going to be kidnapped and used to unlock the cube. However, it's too late, Valentine already captured Sin, and she disappears saying that she needs to bring the key back to Mother. Luckily, Sol and Izuna were able to track her location and chase after her. So Valentine was actually able to extract the key from Sin's gear cells, and she also brainwashed Sin and forced him to fight Sol. Sol was able to beat Sin and return him back to normal, but by that point, Valentine had already ran off with his gear cells and was going to use them to activate the cube. Sin asks Sol if his mom is okay, and Sol explains the situation that she's in, and that the only reason that she's still even remotely alive is because of how much Kai cared. Sol, Sin, and Izuna continue to chase after Valentine, but they're met with her Vizuel army. They appear to be extremely outnumbered until Kai shows up with his own Illyrian Kingdom army, and they clash. During this point, Kai and Sol have a heart-to-heart, -heart, and Sin has a Sindere moment about how much he doesn't really like his father, but really he does like his father. Kai summons a portal for Sin to take to catch up with Sol and the others, as Sol, Sin, and Izuna continue to chase after Valentine while Kai and his army stay back and defend the people. They eventually reach a sealed gate that would lead into the backyard and are trying to find a way to enter it. And then just as they're thinking of a way to enter it, it immediately opens and that man comes out of it. しかし今数人くそ。なんと不可解な。これではまるであの男に助けられたかのようだ。どんな親切かは知らねえが、疑ってる So upon Sol, Izuna, and Dr. Paradigm passing through the gate, they're able to interrupt Valentine from activating the cube. Up until this point, Valentine had never felt any emotions before, but now for the first time, she's finally feeling the full effects of being salty. Valentine transforms and attempts to fight back. Sin shows up at the last moment and blocks the attack and tells Sol to go after the cube and attempt to dismantle it. Sin and the others manage to distract Valentine long enough for Sol to break the key and stop the process of the cube from activating. In response to this, Valentine decides to self-destruct while closing the gate to the backyard. Sin and the others attempt to run out while Sol stays behind to fight her. The gate to the backyard completely closes with Sol being the only one left behind. Valentine transforms into a giant, big castle thing, and then Sol and her have a final battle.
Upon defeating her, you can hear the voice of Arya saying random voice lines in the background. This is to imply that part of Arya's DNA was within Valentine, which explains why Valentine looks exactly like her. Like honestly, how many times are they gonna make this dude kill his girlfriend? That man approaches Soul and then once again tells him that it isn't his time to die because he'll be needed again in the future, and he teleports him back into the real world. As Sol is teleported out kicking and screaming that he's going to get his revenge and kill him, he then meets again with Sin, Izuna, and Dr. Paradigm. Everyone reunites, and Kai, as a thank you to Dr. Paradigm, offers a place within Illyria for him and everyone on his island to reside in, and to let everyone know that not all gears are awful and need to be destroyed, so that's cool. And I guess you could say Dr. Paradigm returns the favor because eventually at some point he does learn how to free Dizzy from her binding. And then after that, we're left with this ominous post credit scene surrounding that man and Raven. Book. あれ お守りいたします。その必要はないよ。時の次第は歴史が語ればいい。お前の務め、その右利にあることです。刑事の時は近い。あるいはもう待ってはくれない。プレデリック、僕が君が常世の子になる。and that concludes the events of Guilty Gear 2 Overture, otherwise known as the Baptisma 13 event. At this point, there's a temporary time of peace, but the world is still afraid on when the next Valentine attack might be. The universal will in the backyard keeps sending Valentines to attack, so what's to stop it from doing it again? And you guessed it, that's exactly what happens. Eventually, after some time has passed, Ramlethal Valentine appears and declares war on the world. <laughs> And so that concludes the Guilty Gear story from the very first game all the way up to the beginning of Exerd. Now if you go to Arc System Works channel, they have story recaps from Exerd all the way up to current to get you ready for Strive. If you want me to do a recap of the Exerd story before Strive comes out, I might do that. Just let me know in the comments down below if you're interested. But hopefully this was able to get you caught up at least up till Exerd, and I hope you enjoyed. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace out.